Hey, good morning once again, options traders. Well, it's that time again for more idiotic ideas. We're up to number 11, analyze your option position. Now, for those of you who may not have caught some of the previous idiotic ideas, I always feel like I need to give a little background of where this series of videos came from. They are from a book from a person who claims to be an expert to have run a newsletter and has all kinds of accolades that would make you think that this is a good person to follow. And I'm not going to name the author or the book. My intention is not to bash this person, although he certainly deserves it, because the ideas in this book are so incredibly bad. But for me, for somebody who's trying to come up with ideas for videos, it is the gift that keeps on giving. And even though I think it's always better to focus on the positive of what to do, sometimes it can be beneficial to see what not to do. And if you want a whole list of things of not to do with options, this is the book. So let's take a look at Idiotic Ideas number 11, Analyze Your Option Position. Before we do, as always, please be sure to click like and subscribe. It's greatly appreciated and helps to promote the channel. So in this little section of the book, he says, the beauty with options is that you can mathematically measure what an option is worth and what your probability of profit will be. Try to buy options where the option is under the fair price. Well, this is loaded with so many mistakes, I don't even know where to start, but it's like saying, try to buy options that will only produce profits. To say that we can mathematically measure what an option is worth is completely false. It is true under a set of assumptions, but of course, we have to wait and see if those assumptions come true. So can you mathematically measure what an option is worth and what your probability of profit will be? Not really. So to see why, for options, there are, are really five types of volatility. Some traders say four, and I think that's probably a better number, but I'm going to throw in a fifth one here as well. We have historic volatility, and that's something that we can actually measure. That's usually what shows up on your broker's platform that says this stock is trading at a 30% volatility. That's looking back in the past. It's an actual number, something that we can go back and with a mathematical formula measure. Then there's what's called the future volatility. This is the volatility that will occur in the future over the life of the option. Then we also have what's called the implied volatility. This is what we're looking at a pricing model and saying, well, what is the market implying the future volatility will be? And we can figure that out by saying, well, what's the option's price? And if we know the option's price, we use that as a known we work the model backwards. We'll look at some examples in a moment. And we say, well, the market is implying that this must be the volatility. You can also call another type of volatility the forecast volatility. This would be your opinion. So you might say, well, the historic volatility has been 30%. The market's implying 35%, but I think it's going to be 50%. That would be your forecast volatility. And then finally, we have what's called the realized volatility. This is what we can say once the option has expired. Once it's hit the finish line, we can go back and say, doesn't matter what the implied was or what your forecast was, this is the answer. Now, it turns out that's what we need to know. If you want to make the claim that we can mathematically figure out the probability for an option to have a profit or how much that profit will be, we need to know the future volatility. And unfortunately, that's something that can't be known until you get to expiration when it becomes the realized volatility. And by then it's too late because you're at expiration. Now, again, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that say, oh yes, it's super easy. Just look at what the implied volatility is versus what's happened in the past. And if the implied is higher, you should be a seller. And if it's lower, you should be a buyer. If it were only that easy. It's not. You need to know what the future volatility will be, and that's something that just, by definition, can't be known. So, for example, let's take a look at the VIX, the volatility index. This is the measured or the historic volatility for the S&P 500 index. And you can see this is going back from 1990 all the way up until recently, up until about August 1st, 2024, but you can see that over time, it is mean reverting. 
We have some pretty good spikes along the way. We've got some little dips, some troughs in here. But overall, it just goes sideways. And if you measure the volatility over this entire span, it's about 19.5%. And that's a real close number. As long as you're doing some type of a longer term period, 10-year period, it's usually really close to 20%. It just tends to hover around that 20% number. So one way to visualize those five different types of volatilities, let's say this is today's date. Everything to the left would be historic volatility. It's done. We know that those are facts. That was how it was actually calculated. Everything to the right is unknown. That would be the future volatility. And this is really what we want to know when we're trading an option. And it depends on your time frame. If you're trading from this dotted line down to here, you really want to know what will be the volatility in that window. If you're trying to measure it over this entire chart here, you'd want to know what is the volatility over that time period. That's what you need to know, but now you should be able to see there's no way to know that. Now, your forecast volatility is saying, here's my guess, but no mathematical pricing model can give you an accurate assessment of profits or probability based on a guess. The implied volatility would be the market's assessment of the volatility over this period. And so we could kind of measure our own intuition, our own forecast volatility against the implied volatility. And again, this is probably the best that we have because we don't have a crystal ball. What we can do is say, this is probably a pretty good range to guess where the volatility will be. And we can make a judgment call as to whether it's high or low. But that doesn't mean you can mathematically assess the probabilities and profits. And then finally, the realized would be the actual number on that expiration date. But the main thing to understand is that when you're looking at historic volatility, that's everything in the past. And yes, we can get a pretty good gauge as to where it likes to live. In this case, the SPY tends to hang out around 20%. But the one number that you need to know, if you want to make an assessment about the probability and the level of profit, is the future volatility. And there's just simply no way to know that. And so to see these ideas in action, let's go over to barchart.com and take a look at a pricing model. So this is the pricing model that's at barchart.com and we put in the underlying price. Let's say it's trading for 100, strike price of 100, days to expiration 30. I'm going to leave the risk-free rate at zero, volatility at 30%, and dividends at 0%. And it says under these conditions, 343 is the fair value of the option. And remember what that means. It means if you paid 343 or sold for 343, not counting commissions, you would be expected to break even in the long run. Not necessarily on any given option, but if you did these hundreds or thousands of times, you would just break even. That's the definition of a fair value or the theoretical value. So we've got this into our pricing model here. And so our assessment, our forecast volatility in this example would be 30%. That's what, for whatever reason, we think the volatility will be over the life of the option over the next 30 days. Now, of course, nobody knows what that's going to be, but we can gain some insights into what the market thinks by looking at the price. So we think the option should be worth 343, but we look at our broker's platform and let's say it's trading for five. Well, how do you reconcile that? See, we can't use a different stock price. That is the actual stock price. We're analyzing the 100 strike. There's 30 days to expiration. No dividends. The only thing where we have some wiggle room is with volatility. That's why they say the true unknown of an option is the volatility. So what we can do is we can come down to the implied volatility calculator here, and we put in the market price of the option which I said hypothetically is five. And if you type that in, it says 43.74. And what that means is that the market is implying that the future volatility will be 
0.74, let's just call it 44% over the next 30 days. And if that turns out to be true, then the option's price, whether you bought it or sold it, will just be a fairly valued option. So let's go see if it works. Let's put in 43.74, and there it is. See, we're just using this as a known. Normally, we use these five factors, six with dividends, to give us this output. But now what we're doing is we're making the volatility the unknown. And we're saying, well, I do know the market price. So if we type that in, we can say, well, the market must be implying that there's going to be about a 44% volatility over the life of the option. Why? Because people wouldn't be willing to buy and sell at that price. That's the current market price. You can't argue that. That is the price that we're seeing in the market. And the only way that people would think that's a fair deal is if everybody kind of said, yeah, you know what, this is probably a pretty good assessment about volatility. So now back to his quote, how are you going to use this information to calculate what your profits will be? What will the volatility end up being in the next 30 days? Good luck. We don't know. And so to say that we can calculate what your probability of profit will be is a complete misunderstanding of options and pricing formulas. That is just simply not possible. But a lot of people think that it is, and they'll say, well, if 30% was the historic and the market's bidding it up to 44%, I should be a seller because this is too high. That is simply not true. The market is putting it here for a reason. And so again, to say that we can use a pricing model to assess the probability of winning and what our profits will be is just simply not possible. All right, now there's a second part to the same section of the book, and he says that know that the higher the probability of profit and the higher the delta, the better the play. And you're going, well, how is that possible? First of all, you can't know it, but if you want to make an assessment of what the future volatility will be, then you can say, under those conditions, we can figure out what the delta is. And he's saying the higher the delta, the better the play. But who needs a pricing model for that? If you understand options, you know that the only way to get the deltas up is to put the option in the money. And of course, that's relative. It could be just a little bit in the money with almost no time to go. You'll get very high deltas. Or if we have a longer dated option, we have to push that option super deep in the money. That's just the Trumpification effect. Those are two ways to get your deltas up there. So let's go over to an Excel spreadsheet and see how that works. All right, so now we're into an Excel spreadsheet. This is from Macro Option. There's the website, macrooption.com. It's a one-time fee. It's a really wonderful analytical tool. A little tough to figure out at first, but it does some really cool stuff. Let's say analyze lots of positions, change volatility, dividends, anything you'd ever want to change. But let's say that the underlying stock is 100. Let's give it 30 days to expiration, actually 30 and a quarter. And that's because it's using actual days from the calendar that we can change right here. So we've got 30 and a quarter left, saying that the option is worth $3.60. Now, according to the book, the higher the probability for profit and the higher the delta, the better the play. Well, first of all, it's always wrong to say one type of strategy or strike is better. There are always trade-offs. So the one thing that we can look at, according to a pricing model, do you see this little term down here called ND2? That's just a normal probability under a bell curve. It's part of the Black-Scholes pricing model. And effectively what it is, it's the probability that the stock price is going to be above the exercise price. Now, technically, that's assuming that the underlying stock returns the risk-free rate, which should be higher than that. So your probabilities are most likely higher than what's shown here, but it's just an assumption of the model called risk-neutral pricing. So if we scroll down here, now we're starting to see probabilities 27%, 48 54 how do I know that this is at the money? Because we know that an at the money option has roughly a 50 delta. And here we go, right there at 100. 
shows about 48 delta. Then we go 54, 64, 73. Look at this. And eventually we come up here and we hit 1. Now, most of you know your delta cannot exceed 1 because that's shares of stock. But take a look where that's lining up. Right there at 133. So think about it. We have roughly a 30-day option, $100 strike, and the stock's at 133. This is $33 in the money. So we know it's got to trade for at least $33 plus a tiny bit of extrinsic value. The problem with that is that in a different section of the book, he says never pay more than about $2 for an option. So if you're trying to push these deltas as high as possible to have the highest probability for success, you're going to have to use deep in the money options unless you go super short term with them barely in the money. So for instance, let's change the number of days up here and let's go to, let's say we'll go to, knock it down to like maybe three days. Now let's come back to ND2 and look what happens. Look at how quickly we hit one. See now the stock's at 110. So I can have it 10 points in the money and have delta one. If I knock this down some more, we've only got a little over a day to go. Now look what happens. Here's your ND2. Now we're hitting delta one with a stock at about 106. That's still a $6 option. So how are you gonna get this to where you have a very high delta but not paying more than a couple of bucks? Well, let's see if we can, we'll knock it down to about a quarter of a day. So let's look at column Q right here. And now we can see delta one. See now we're hitting with a stock price around 103. So if you really and truly want to get the deltas as high as possible to give yourself a higher probability for profit and say if that's the better play, if you want to keep the options price, let's say under a couple of bucks, which is what he says in a different part of the book, and you want to keep your deltas high, the only choice you have is to trade something that is slightly in the money by 30, 40 cents, but with almost no time to go. That's the only way that that could be done. Otherwise, you're going to be paying 30, 40, 50 bucks for them. And I'm not against that. That's basically the stock replacement strategy, but he's saying that is absolutely no good. You've got to get your deltas high, your probability for profit high, and you do that by simply looking at a calculator. If options trading were that easy, we wouldn't even need calculators. So here's what it would look like graphically. Here's our $100 call. The current curve is in blue. Over time, what happens? The current curve moves towards the black. And the only type of option you could trade if you're trying to keep it under a couple of bucks would be like this, when the current curve has almost met that black line. So if you look, and let's say that the stock is maybe right here. Yeah, if we zoom in, you can see that this red line is getting pretty close to that black line. In other words, those deltas are getting very close to one. And that would be a very high delta option, but you're out of time. And that's the only way that you can make that work. So the point is, there's actually lots of points, but probably the biggest one is that if somebody comes to you with this, what appears to be a fail-safe method and saying, oh, you just have to analyze your options. It's mathematically shown, there's a pricing model. And he even talks about how it won the Nobel Prize in 1997, making it sound like options trading is easy because there's a pricing model. The pricing model is 100% correct if you give it the correct volatility and the correct interest rate. I've talked about that in a previous video. Those are called parameter Greeks for that reason. But he never mentions that. He just says, go to a pricing model and you can tell if your option is cheap or expensive. And if you trade options that way, you're going to think you've got a mathematical edge for you, and you're probably putting a very big edge against you. And for anyone who'd like to learn more about the arts and science of options trading, please check out the Alpha Trader course, Strategy Lab, and a candlesticks and technical analysis course. It's all at optionsa-z.com. Also, please join us at Options A to Z's Facebook trading group, and you can find a link in the description below.